Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 27th annual four-way test speech contest sponsored by the Rotary Club of Merrimack and located here at the Merrimack High School Little Theater here in the town of Merrimack, New Hampshire. I am Maureen Mooney, a Rotarian and the moderator of tonight's contest. At this time, I'd like to recognize Bob Best, who is this year's president of the Rotary Club of Merrimack. Welcome, Bob. Brian Tangway, the president-elect, and Maureen Tracy, the vice president of our club. The four-way test speech contest originated in the late 1990s by the Rotary Club and is a way for students in our community to enhance written and speaking skills. Each presentation is centered around the tenets of being a Rotarian called the four-way test, which are recited before each meeting. The four ways are, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Along with Rotarians this evening from the Merrimack Rotary Club, we are also joined by Rotarians from the Hollis Brookline Club who are judging today's contest. Welcome and thank you all. Our motto in Rotary is service above self. So we want to thank everyone for volunteering here to make tonight's contest possible. More information on our club can be found on our website, www.merrimackrotary.com. According to the Rotary rules of the contest, a contestant's speech must be original in content and apply the Rotary four-way test in everyday relationships with other people. The speech must be given from memory and should not be read, though adequate notes are acceptable. And the speech shall be no less than five nor more than seven minutes in length or it is automatically disqualified. The rules of the contest are set forth by Rotary and the prizes are funded by the Rotary Club of Merrimack at $250 for the first place winner, $150 for the second place winner, $75 for third place, and $25 for all the other contestants. The winners will also get the opportunity to read their speeches at a regular breakfast meeting of the Rotary Club of Merrimack. We have a timekeeper this evening, Troy Arthun, who has done it several times before, and he will give the appropriate visual signals to each speaker, and each speaker has been reviewed with regards to those signals. Now let's meet our first contestant, that is contestant number one. About three years ago, a family in Merrimack started to enroll two of their children at a nearby private school. Everything seemed to be going smoothly until the admissions board found out they were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The application process came to a screeching halt and the children were denied admission to the school. Some of you may think that religious intolerance and discrimination only occurs in other countries. After all, we can see the evidence of this all throughout history, from wars and massacres to genocides and holocausts. However, religious discrimination is also occurring in the United States. Perhaps not on such an extreme level, but the scary part here is that nobody is talking about it. I am here today to tell you the truth. Religious discrimination and intolerance is a real problem in the United States, and it is time for this injustice to end. Prejudice is defined in Oxford Dictionary as a preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. People of faith often face prejudice in our society from their peers, the media, and our government. Brian Boucher, a Catholic lawyer, 
was recently nominated by President Trump to sit on the U.S. District Court in Nebraska. And according to Fox News, Senator Kamala Harris and Maisie Hirono were reported to have, quote, subjected to scrutiny and specifically targeted Boucher for his faith in order to cast doubt on his ability to serve in public office, close quote. Situations like these are demeaning, but they are not rare. Fox News further reports, academics, social groups, and college organizations regularly ridicule Christians by calling them hateful, bigoted, and privileged, among other labels. I would like to ask you all, have you ever formed an opinion about someone based solely upon their religious beliefs? Foreign countries are not the only ones dealing with this issue. I have even had my own experience with religious prejudice here in Merrimack. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And during my sophomore year, a girl in my grade started spreading rumors about me that I was a member of a cult, that my dad was a polygamist, and other things. None of the things she said were true. And as you can imagine, I was frustrated, horrified, and hurt. She was slandering something that brings me peace and joy, and I consider to be one of the most sacred things in my life. As a society, we need to become more aware of our biases against people who believe differently than us. Because the truth is, not only are these biases often unfounded, but there is no room in this world for hatred. After all, our country was established on the ideals of religious freedom. When the pilgrims first came to America in 1620, they were fleeing from religious persecution. So why is it then that 400 years later, religious intolerance continues to occur in our society? The Constitution clearly declares that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Not only is religious tolerance fair to all concerned, but being tolerant is the law. The government has clear, clearly stated that everyone has the right to affiliate with whatever religion they desire without persecution. In addition, breaking down the stigma around religion will build goodwill and better friendships. The only way to do this is to start having open and honest conversations with each other. Religion should not be a taboo. Up until my sophomore year, I didn't often talk about being a member of the church because I was scared and embarrassed of what other people might say or think. But when I confronted my classmate about the rumors she was spreading, I was able to listen to her point of view and let her know where I was coming from and the truth about me and my religion. As a 15-year-old girl, I had already learned that others' perceptions of me would change when I told them I was religious. People automatically assumed that I held certain political beliefs did certain activities or lived a certain lifestyle without even getting to know me. So I tried to hide it as much as possible. However, in talking with my classmate, I had the realization that one conversation could get rid of the misconceptions people had about me. I began to talk more freely about my faith and open up about what I believe in, not with the intent to convert others, but to break down the barriers and the stigma around religion in doing this, I have been only met with positive reactions. People are truly curious and just want to understand. Most often, religious discrimination is the effect of uneducated and untrue judgments. In order to end this problem and maintain goodwill and friendships, an open and civil dialogue must commence between all people, regardless of religious devotion. Furthermore, Creating a safe environment where all religious views and ideas are accepted will not only benefit the individual, but our community. Polls conducted by Pew Research Center show that 76% of adults who consider religion to be important in their lives felt spiritual peace and well-being at least once a week. Additionally, the National Alliance on Mental Illness has stated that religiosity reduces suicide rates, alcoholism, and drug abuse. Creating a society of acceptance and tolerance will help cultivate happier and healthier citizens. In conclusion, I would like to challenge each of you to be more open, slower to pass judgments on, or make remarks about someone else's religion. There is no need to bully, put down, or discriminate against someone else because they believe differently than you. 
As Nelson Mandela said, quote, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, then they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. I implore each of you, learn to love. Thank you. As the judges tally their scores, I just want to say just a few words about the Rotary Club of Merrimack and also about some Rotarians. So the Rotary Club of Merrimack meets each week on Thursday mornings at 7.15 a.m. at the John O'Leary Center. Each Rotarian takes turns hosting the meeting, which consists of a breakfast buffet, fellowship, a brief meeting and a guest speaker every week, every Thursday at 7.15. Meetings end promptly at 8.30 a.m. Guest speakers have included in the past businessmen and women here in town and also other members of our community. We always welcome visitors and new members. So please, if you have never been to a Rotary meeting before, I encourage you to make the Merrimack Rotary Club meeting your first meeting. Before we meet our second contestant, I want to point out one Rotarian who has helped at these contests year after year doing one specific but very important job, and that is to usher each of the contestants down the aisle. That's our very own Jane Hoover. So thank you, Mrs. Hoover, for helping out year after year. And now, contestant number two. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. Proverbs 31, 25. Senior year is the first real opportunity to change the trajectory of your life. It's a very transitional time in a young person's life. During this time, you assess what you deem most important and form an after high school plan. What becomes particularly tough is the brutal comparisons amongst seniors. The pressure can almost feel paralyzing. Everyone's after high school plan is so different and specific to them that comparing seems almost absurd. The judgment placed on post high school plans causes students unnecessary stress and loss of motivation to fulfill a dream. We base our plans off factors that mark our lives. Someone's plan may reflect their financial situation, home life, how hard they had to try in high school, or how they live best. Or maybe all the stars have aligned and the end goal is in reach. But all plans are based off what is best for that individual. Through this transitional time, I've realized college, community college, the military, and gap years are all good paths of their own. All of it works for someone. The most important thing, though, is to not trip on what people say along the way how much money you'll make, how happy you'll be, or how long you'll be in school. Every and all paths can lead you to a place of peace, fulfillment, and stability if you're willing to make it that. Each pathway can be justified. In true Rotary four-way test fashion, I ask, is it the truth? Yes, there is an abundant amount of studies on the long-term benefits of each pathway. In terms of the college benefits, it's said that by 2020, an estimated two-thirds of job openings will require post-secondary education or training. And a college student could defend the statement and say everyone should make their best effort to try and go. But that's not so simple for everyone. According to the Community College Research Center, 69% of community college students work while attending classes. Those students earn money throughout as they couldn't afford to do it any other way. The point is every post-high school plan can be viewed in a positive light by the individuals who gravitate towards it. They claim that plan is their own. A lot of people become so narrow-minded that narrow-minded that if it's not their plan, it's wrong. Though, every, though everyone has their own small idea of what they want their life to look like, and it's after graduation that we all part our ways to get there. Life is a bunch of human journeys that intersect at certain points to give us the chance to help each other, to help in ways in which we have once struggled, to pass on knowledge we wish we had known. Also important, is it fair to all concerned? Yes, it is fair to say that any and all paths have been well thought out and considered before it has become a plan. I believe causing another senior to second guess their plan is very destructive. We need to remember that what may, best be, what may be best for you may not be what's best for them. 
As we all face this life transition, we have all lost days, weeks, and maybe months coming to terms with what we say we'll do. So to say something impulsive can be just enough to make someone's dream feel big and themselves too small. I'd like to say confidently that for the most part, a lot of us seniors have dreams that we love and we want to feel are in reach. When we feel called to do something, we want to follow through. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Without a doubt, I'm aware that empowering other individuals to go after their thing has and always will have the capability to form community. Though our plans aren't similar, we as seniors are. If we would like to admit it or not, we don't entirely know what we're doing. We're a bunch of 18-year-olds trying the best we can, yet we make it harder on each other. I surveyed a group of 25 seniors with four questions that can easily summarize the speech. I first asked during the application process, did you stress about making the right decision? Four out of five kids replied yes. I followed up asking, do you feel you're competing with other people? Again, four out of five kids replied yes. Every answer was a no-brainer to each individual senior. Hands went up fast and texts came back quick. So if we all feel the same, why do we make it harder? Truthfully, there was times I tried to reassure someone that their dream wasn't out of reach, but my own still felt quite big. My plan is to get my doctorate in occupational therapy, and if you don't know, OT is a type of rehab, and someday I want to work in a hospital. I will hold this dream until I can say I did that, yet there is still so much I don't know in this ever-changing journey, and I know that. That is the point, to pretty much end up in a spot we didn't expect. I find myself gripping to things in my life that I call constant, as all my other things seem to be going through their own tiny evolution or micro disruption. During this time of uncertainty, it's important to be gentle with others. Though we may feel we're walking our paths alone and blindly, there is strength in empowerment. There is strength in not knowing. Finally, will it be beneficial to all concerned? According to the survey results, clearly yes. It would be beneficial to move in the direction of encouragement and truly mean it. Not the half-hearted smile we think we should be giving. I've seen it. Judgment can cause a vulnerable senior to second-guess everything and settle before they've even graduated. To prove this, I asked that same group of 25 seniors, would you feel better if no one was pestering you about your plan? Three out of five, or over half the kids, said yes. Lastly, on a scale of one to 10, rate how stressful you found the decision-making process. All but one rated at a number greater than or equal to five. For myself, I rated at a good seven or eight, but I was still really lucky. I have a huge amount of support around me, but some just don't have that. The judgment can be destructive, and I got lucky. I fear the people who will make every attempt to make you second guess impulsively a plan you considered permanent. The senior year process also goes way beyond forming the plan. It shows the way in which we handle adversity, how we respond when we have no idea what's going on. I still don't know exactly where I'll end up after high school, but I know the decision will be specific to me. If I had to do it all over again, I would do it the exact same way. Sometimes I still do need to remind myself that I don't need a 1 a.m. night after work and practice to do well in school. I would put in that same crazy amount of effort again, but maybe for my own well-being, I'd attend a little more yoga. Really, I would just tell myself that no matter what, I'm going to be good. Actually, maybe I'll be great. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. I do not fear the future. One may ask him or herself, what does the Rotary Club do? And the Merrimack Rotary Club prides itself in contributing to the community through various fundraisers that take place during the year. On the 4th of July, we have the Independence Day celebration, an annual time that begins with the pancake breakfast here at the high school, and then a fun day on the grounds of either the high school or the upper elementary school. Also, on Thanksgiving Day, the Turkey Trot 5K, 5K road race for runners and or walkers uh, on Thanksgiving morning. Yearly, we do that. And then in the month of December, you may see our annual Christmas tree sales over at Watson Park. We're there pretty much the whole month of December selling everybody their Christmas trees, either a balsam or a Fraser, or sometimes a hybrid, the silver fir. All right, are we all set, judges? With that, contestant number three. I am seventh in our class. My weighted GPA is a 4.85. 
and my unweighted is a 3.9. I'm in the top 2%. I'm not telling you this to brag or to show off, rather to prove a point. As high school students, we're placed on a pedestal and held to the impossible expectation of being perfect all the time. And it's not just my expectations of myself. It's my friends, my family, even my teachers. It's no longer that I can't fail a test because I'd be disappointed in myself. Now I face the shocked looks on the faces of my peers when I tell them my grade, and the pity smile I get from my teachers who hand back my work and tell me it wasn't my best. I know it wasn't. It should have been perfect. Merriam-Webster defines perfectionism as the disposition to regard anything less than perfect as unacceptable. Perfectionism runs rampant in my high school, whether it's the perfect hair, the perfect clothes, the perfect outfit, the perfect car. It's everywhere. A child development researcher at West Virginia University found that as many as two in five children and adolescents are perfectionists. Unfortunately, while striving for perfectionism can be a motivator for many students, the perfectionist mindset of the student body and society is growing and becoming increasingly detrimental to a child's mental and even physical health. And so we must ask, is it the truth? As a struggling perfectionist, I empathize with others of a similar mindset to mine quite often. It seems everywhere I go, someone is berating themselves over not getting a perfect score on a test or a quiz. In fact, self-oriented perfectionism has seen an increase, especially in students who are demanding higher expectations of themselves, according to the American Psychological Association. In regard to the detrimental effects on one's health, the Review of General Psychology found that perfectionists are more likely to struggle with depression or anxiety, and they are more likely to commit suicide. However, as common as it is for students to place pressure on themselves, it's becoming increasingly more common for parents to place pressure on their students. In a study done by students and faculty at Arizona State University, it was found that high achievement expectations and academic pressure from parents have been implicated in rising levels of stress and reduced well-being among adolescents. Clearly, perfectionism is only becoming more present, and with more people pushing an individual to be flawless, it's hurting their mental health. Is it fair? Is it fair that I come home every day past nine after a student council meeting, filming a student broadcast, planning the next meeting of a club that I'm co-president of, and four hours of dance, all of which are intended to make me look well-rounded, just to have two hours of homework to do before I can go to bed? It's not fair, and it's not healthy. According to Psychology Today, the expectation and need to excel in multiple domains can be enormously taxing for children and adolescents, lending themselves to exhaustion, burnout, depression, and anxiety. Of course, as the article later explains, it's healthy to set realistic goals and strive for high quality work. It's when we start defining our self-worth by our performance in various aspects of our lives that it becomes unhealthy and dangerous. Thus, the perfectionist mindset that is placed upon adolescents by many factors is truly unfair to their psychological well-being. Will it build goodwill? Perfectionism, according to Brene Brown, is not about self-improvement. It's about trying to earn approval. Living in a society where everyone is constantly trying to earn approval won't be beneficial to the progress of society. Instead, it will lead to a stagnant society. Consequently, perfectionism at its unhealthiest cannot build goodwill and friendships. When you're hyper-focused on getting everything right and berating yourself when you don't, Psychology Today emphasizes, you lose out on the wisdom that comes from examining why you made the mistakes you did. That being said, changing our mindset can increase goodwill and build better friendships. We can work together as a society to reframe our thinking, focusing less on the mistakes and failures and more on the lessons that can be learned from those mistakes and failures. Not only will that bolster the goodwill itching to spread to more of our society, it will strengthen friendships with a promise of newfound support and acceptance. Those who have other-oriented perfectionism, where, according to the Washington Post, people have rigorous standards for others and treat them with hostility and disdain when they fall short, will feel the biggest impact on their personal relationships when they can learn to separate the people they care about from their failures. If everyone with other-oriented perfectionism is successful in becoming more accepting of the people around them, their friendships and goodwill towards others can only flourish. Will it be beneficial to all concerned? It is abundantly clear that perfectionism is detrimental to individuals, as it brings with it a host of medical problems. According to BBC.com, having a perfectionist mindset can even lead to early mortality. 
However, eradicating that mindset won't just help individuals, it will help society. Surely, individuals will worry less, and the health problems that may have surfaced from the perfectionism will begin to fade. Families will grow together as parents make time to play with their children and spend less time drilling multiplication tables into their heads. Friendships will flourish as expectations become more manageable, and people drop the extracurricular activities that they don't care about to spend time with the people that they do. In fact, those who can shift their mindset away from perfectionism can actually accomplish more, according to Elizabeth Scott, a published wellness coach. Most importantly, society will benefit from a bunch of psychologically healthy, goal-oriented individuals who are self-motivated and capable of accepting their failures as lessons for the future. So instead of defining ourselves by numbers on a piece of paper, let's start defining ourselves by our accomplishments. Start defining yourselves by the things that excite you and the things you'll continue to, to do after high school is over. Start defining yourself by your best qualities, your biggest accomplishments, and your worst flaws. Let go of the impossible expectation to be perfect. It will only hurt you. It's not easy, but we need to let ourselves and others see more than the A we got in 10th grade bio. Thank you. The annual fundraisers I spoke of previously, one may ask themselves, what are they for? The funds earned through annual fundraisers are given directly back into the Merrimack community. One way this is done is through the club fundraising for four generous scholarships for Merrimack High School students. That is, graduates of Merrimack High School. The scholarships are the Applied Technology Scholarship, the Arts Scholarship, the Community Service Scholarship, and the President's Award. Rotary has a different president each year, and the President's Award goes to a graduating senior pursuing a certain major or a certain field, left up to the choice of that year's Rotarian president. These Rotary scholarships assist residents with much needed tuition assistance, that is for sure. All set? All right. Contestant number four. Oprah Winfrey, Beyonce, Diane Sawyer, Carrie Underwood, what do all of these talented women have in common besides career success? Growing up, these distinguished women competed in pageants. What comes to mind when you hear the word pageant? Do you think of fancy dresses and beautiful women vying to see who's the prettiest? For most, the idea of a pageant is so foreign and unrealistic that one might form a negative opinion without knowing much about what each program is about. According to Flow Psychology, pageants date back to 19th century England, with Archibald Montgomery hosting the first pageant in 1839. The first Miss America competition occurred in 1921 in Atlantic City, and in the 98 years that it has been running, it has become the leading provider of scholarships for young women. It is estimated that 2.5 million women compete in pageants each year, and I am proud to say that I am one of those women. Over the past four years, I have competed in numerous pageants, and the experiences I have had have been truly beneficial for my life. Initially, I was drawn into the glitz and glamour of doll. What little girl didn't want to be a princess while growing up? As I continued to compete, though, I realized that pageants are so much more than a beauty competition. For many women, pageants can be life-changing. Society should view pageants as a positive way for women to gain confidence and personal growth within themselves. Is it the truth? Absolutely. The Miss America Foundation estimates that since the year 2007, Miss America and Miss America's Outstanding Teen contestants have raised over $20 million for the Children's Miracle Network hospitals. While competing, I've earned a great sense of pride in raising money for the organization focused on providing funds for families to cover the expensive costs of medical treatment. 
Programs such as Miss America are largely service oriented and speaking from experience, I love volunteering. With the titles I've earned, I've been able to work with organizations focused on veterans, female empowerment, STEM, and environmental projects. A recent article from the Harvard Gazette stated that females who compete in pageants tend to perform better under pressure and in a competitive setting than those who do not compete. These skills can be used in a variety of these settings, but especially in a professional career. For a moment, think back to your most recent job interview. How'd you feel before, during, and after? The toughest part of a pageant interview is the variety of questions one can be asked. In one moment, you can be asked which kitchen utensil you might be. Then, in the other, your upcoming opinion on the presidential election. The women who compete are intelligent and driven, and not just a pretty face. It is more than a beauty pageant. Are pageants fair to all concerned? Yes. Many people have assumed that pageants are selective, only allowing a certain look for each contestant. In reality, there's a pageant for every woman. Pageants are for petite women, women in agriculture, married women, and the list goes on. Regardless of the outcome of a pageant, every woman can say that they have learned something about themselves. For their first time, there's usually a huge sense of accomplishment. A lot can go into this, including time spent practicing talent and interview. The time I have spent has been well worth it in the end due to the confidence boost and personal growth I have gained. Pageants are fair based on the rewards that a contestant can receive as a result of competing. These rewards can include interview skills, confidence, and of course, scholarship dollars. Miss America Camille Schreier was crowned on Thursday, December 19th and received a scholarship of $50,000. According to the New York Times, the Miss America organization awards over $50 million to the 12,000 contestants that compete annually. I must reiterate, this organization is the largest provider of scholarships for young women. These scholarships help women obtain a higher education and graduate debt-free. Do pageants build goodwill and better friendships? Yes. One unknown benefit of competing in pageants is the friendships one will gain. Miss New Hampshire 2017 Lauren Percy established a nationwide media campaign entitled The Sisterhood is Real. It was driven by candidates all over the nation who shared their experiences and friendships they had gained as a result of competing. Although pageants are usually viewed as competitive in spirit, every woman is genuinely supportive of one another. It is true that empowered women empower women. I'm inspired by females who have begun their own organization and truly have done some amazing things. Pageants teach each contestant to have goodwill based on the experiences that they have while competing. I competed for three years before I won my first title. Initially, I was so discouraged, but I didn't give up. I kept going until I won. Yes, this experience was only a pageant, but the lessons I learned will be beneficial for the rest of my life. I learned that perseverance is not a long race. It is many short races, one after the other. Are pageants beneficial to all concerned? Yes. It is clear that a pageant contestant truly gains a lot out of the experience, regardless of the outcome. I indebt my confidence speaking to you all today to the experiences I have had while competing in pageants. But why should the rest of the population that doesn't compete have a positive opinion? These women are truly inspirational. Pageant candidates make a positive impact on the communities that they serve in. They have a strong willingness to serve, and this earn for humanity is contagious. There is much more than meets the eye when it comes to pageants, and it is crucial that society views pageants as a positive way for women to gain confidence and personal growth within themselves. These women are smart, compassionate, and driven. At the beginning of the speech, I told you all that I compete in pageants, and it is likely that you all formed an immediate opinion of me. I hope that over the course of this time, I have changed your opinion into a positive one. Thank you. Rotary also funds Coats for Kids program. This program provides winter coats to children in Merrimack who are in need. 
The club works with the administrator of the town's welfare department in order to identify those in town who need a new warm winter coat for the winter. It's always good to help those in need, especially those that require assistance in harsh weather. Another unique thing about our club is that we contribute to the food pantries in town. Uh, St. John Newman, a Catholic church in South Merrimack has a food pantry, as well as St. James Methodist Church in North Merrimack. Each month on the first Thursday of the month, the club takes up a collection which is matched by the club for the pantries, as well as for Meals on Wheels, which helps those who are homebound get a nice warm meal. Additionally, some proceeds from the turkey trot are contributed equally to the pantries. Where there is a need in Merrimack, it's there you'll find the Merrimack Rotary. And with that, I'm gonna introduce you to contestant number five. Imagine walking into your house after a long day of work or school. You know one of your family members is home from the presence of their car in the driveway or their shoes just inside the front door. Naturally, you pop your head into their room, say hello, only to see a limp body lying on the ground, their lips blue and their face pale. For so many Americans, this is the sobering reality. We hear it every day, overdose after overdose from opioids reported on the news. Firefighters now being utilized as Narcan distributors. When is it going to end? The opioid crisis is detrimental to our society and therefore it must be stopped. Though is this really the truth? According to Gale Global Issues, in 2016, 43,000 people died from an opioid related overdose. That's 120 deaths per day, five deaths per hour, one death every 12 minutes. This puts the amount of opioid related deaths above that of traffic accident deaths. This is not a problem, this is a crisis. Now, is stopping the opioid crisis fair to all concerned? Yes, it is. In an article published by Gale Global Issues, it states that over 2 million Americans suffer from addiction to either legal or illegal opioids. These people are suffering both physically and mentally. They're in a trap that they are struggling to get out of. Sadly, most of these people will not be able to escape. Many people believe that stopping and finding help is easy and that they can decide at any moment to quit, though it's not that simple. Addicts face the extreme hardship of withdrawal at any attempt to stop. In the book, Painkillers, Prescription Dependency by Eda Walker, it includes a quote of an Oxycontin addict. One minute I'd be freezing, the next minute, I'd be hot and flailing from side to side, he said. Every minute of the day, you felt a whole body hunger. You feel it from your little toe all the way up to your brain, like you're restless, you're closed in. You know what you need, and you can't have it. Today, I would take any other pain than the pain of withdrawal. This person is not alone. Millions of Americans experience this pain during their detoxification process. Though this isn't the end of it, Walker also stated in his book that most addicts return to their previous harmful behavior following detoxification. So treatment is required. We must help our fellow Americans as they suffer. Putting an end to the current opioid crisis will not only build goodwill and better friendships, it will secure and restore families. According to Gale Global Issues, in 2015, 35,000 children required foster care in the United States as a result of the opioid epidemic. These kids must pay the price because their parents were victims of the opioid crisis. It is dismantling families and friendships. Just a few years ago, a close family friend of mine arrived home to find her 35-year-old son on the floor, cold as ice. He was, caring. he was a caring member of his community who always put his best foot forward in everything he did. Many knew that he was a <clears throat> many knew that he was suffering from a heroin addiction but couldn't help him. 
People that care about their loved ones can't do anything except watch them slowly sink deeper into addiction, slowly killing themselves. The bird crisis is destroying the bonds shared between friends and family. Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Yes, it will be. In Gale, Global Issues, it states that in 2015, the opioid crisis cost $504 billion in the U.S. alone. This includes treatment and medical costs, loss of work, judicial processes, and the children left behind foster care. By stopping the opioid crisis, this money can be put towards the lives and futures of the addicts. They can be free from the trap that they're in. I think we can all agree that the opioid crisis needs to be stopped because it is detrimental to American society. As illustrated in this speech, we're all affected in some way, shape, or form because of this crisis. Burying our heads in the sand will only exacerbate the situation, and unfortunately, it will touch each one of us personally. Thank you. A little known fact about Rotary is that there are Rotarians right here in Merrimack High School. And those are the members of the Interact Club. Interact Club is a full-fledged part of Rotary. The club is a high school version of Rotary with its own officers, members, and fundraising. It runs from September through June. Members of Interact volunteer for the Merrimack Club's fundraisers, including our turkey trot and Christmas tree sales. And a special thank you certainly goes out to this year's advisors of the Interact Club, that being Ms. Pelletier and Ms. Carter. All set, judges? With this intro, I'm gonna introduce you to contestant number six. How does your education shape who you will become? How does it shape the way you see the world around you? In a singular place, I have found the answer to both of these questions. A place in which the individuals grow independently and cohesively, respect and acknowledge their place among others, the world, and the environment. This is a place where the individuals are internally motivated and fosters self-confidence, resiliency, independence, cooperation, and self-advocacy. Now think about the place where you last felt all of these components. Probably not often. The place I'm talking about is a school, but not the type of school that comes to mind immediately. The modern school system is not keeping up with the needs of today's generation. With institutions having lost sight of the true meaning of education, the alternative school system, a Montessori education, would foster a generation of students and future leaders equipped with the tools, both internally and externally, to solve some of the world's most pressing issues or even to save the world itself. The prepared environment. Maria Montessori was the founder of the Montessori education and this was one of her concepts behind it. It is Montessori belief that the environment can be designed to facilitate maximum independent learning and exploration by the child making the indoor environment an extension of the outdoor classroom. It has been prepared by Mother Nature herself as a place of structure and of purpose. Respect for the environment and for each other is enhanced by care for materials, cooperation with peers, and completion of tasks, all while understanding and appreciating the order, the harmony, and the beauty in nature. In a Montessorian day, the two prepared environments become one larger, free-flowing Montessori environment. Now, I can see some of you shaking your heads. What about the weather or the supervision? How does this impact work time? Dr. Montessori believed that depriving people of natural experiences is damaging to their soul. In 1911, Montessori stated a necessity to place the soul of the child in contact with creation in order that he may lay up for himself treasure from the directly educating forces of living nature. 
This is true and is widely agreed upon by, by many accredited psychologists. Richard Louvre, author of Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder, believes that nature promotes a healthy lifestyle and boosts mental acuity and creativity while strengthening relationships. As a Montessori alumni, I have grown up with this philosophy firsthand. The students, the students understand themselves, the world, and what they can do to save and respect both. I remember boots squeaking and thudding, the rustle of rain pants. Our faces were hardly visible beneath our technicolored array of raincoats as we stood in a neatly arranged straight line. The second we stepped out of that door, however, we were wild and beautifully unarranged. This is a Montessori recess, but also a Montessori work time. By beaming sun or pelting rain, we were out in it. Despite my waterproof rain gear, I always found myself completely soaked through. I never cared. The wetness seemed to add a challenge that I wanted to overcome. A real chance to test my grit and an extra bit of fun. A chance to really endure nature. As I grew up, I realized that the outdoors was not just a place to play, but was also a place to learn. The earth was my classroom. We designed and built vegetable beds, managed our apple orchard through a microeconomy. We grew and sold our very own greens, analyzed glacier-sculpted eskers and weaving webs of mycorrhizal fungi, and were often found debating the carbon footprint of omnivorism. This not only built goodwill towards the planet, but also a sense of community and friendship in our shared environment with a shared educational drive. Each experience I had gave my education context to the laws and concepts of science and the humanities, and I contribute my growing understanding of this complex and beautiful world around me to the system in which I learned from growing up. A deep appreciation has grown into a desire to protect and to give back, to become a force of change in this world that I care so much about. Having aged into a public high school, I am exposed to a different philosophy. Our modern public school system is based on an industrial era factory model and woefully outmoded for a, 20, for a 21st century meant to prepare students to be active and to resolve our world issues. The public school system was one of the proponents of progressive education in the early 1900s to bring the same standardization and routine to education that they admired in business and in industry. According to the American Enterprise Institute, the familiar school model has an uncanny resemblance to the early 20th century factory, fostering an industrial world. But our expectations of students have changed, so that means it is time that our school system change too. It's time to swap out the factory style early 20th century management for more dynamic, creative, and agile schooling. We need to foster a generation of students who can lead and think dynamically to solve today's challenges with today's tools, benefiting us, our children, and generations to come after. The climate crisis is the battle of our time. The world in which we live in is changing in ways that have real consequences for all of us, not just for polar bears. More, the evidence behind rapid climate change is compelling and undeniable. The climate of the Earth is changing in response to increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases. According to NASA, this is largely a result of human activities. We are hurting our home, and there is no plan B. There is no planet B. This is our time to act. A Montessori education gives tools of discovery and of understanding across the community that we call Earth. The wildly simple joy of being and learning outside lives on in every Montessori student, and this is beneficial to all at this time of crisis. The Montessori philosophy encompasses this as a fair way to encourage individuals to save the environment. This lesson is one of the most essential to change the world, especially with the crisis we face today. By learning through where we live, we learn the beauty and harmony of what we have been offered through the environment. We want to protect it, and no amount of rain should stop that. Thank you. As I mentioned, we have members of the Hollis Brookline Rotary Club helping us out today, as they do every year. And I want to say a few things about that club. 
Uh, first of all, they have within their membership a former Rotary District Governor. And this is a colossal size job. Uh, this individual Rotarian volunteer oversees the 49 clubs in our Rotary District, this part of the country, made up of New Hampshire and Vermont. Uh, Vanel Rao, who's with us today in the audience and comes almost yearly, uh, there he is. <laughs> Spent an entire year visiting these clubs, mentoring these clubs, building membership, strengthening communication, it goes on and on. The second thing I want to say about the Hollis Brookline Club is that they established their own four-way test speech contest, Hollis Brooklyn High School. And as a return to the favor of them judging our contest, we judge theirs uh, in March. And so we were glad to be able to give you an example of how a contest is run and have you take that example and establish your own. So congratulations on that. And it's great again to have you here. Next, I want to introduce you to contestant number seven. Cell phone use in school is a controversial topic that has been long debated by teachers who either want to incorporate into their lesson or ban it completely. If used right, a cell phone can be a useful tool. It allows you to have quick access to notes and is a great place to store information about assignments. However, many students misuse this privilege by cheating in school or to distract themselves from the lesson. This problem can negatively affect the student's grades, ability to learn, attitude towards teachers, and attitude towards school. Is it the truth? Yes, according to ABC News, cell phones in class have a direct correlation to falling grades. I've experienced firsthand the effect of phones in school. During class, I was constantly distracted by my phone. If I got a notification from a friend, or even that my grade changed, I always had an excuse to look down. It was addicting. The time I spent down looking at my phone was time I wasn't listening to what the teacher had to say and time I wasn't taking notes. Scientists who study the effects of divided attention in people know that when attention is divided between two tasks, fewer items regarding those tasks may be recalled later, a concept called retention in psychology. Additional research on electronic devices shows that smartphones can reduce the ability to think to a person's full potential, and additional research from Stanford University reveals that intense multitasking decreases the efficiency of completing a given task. As a result, I would turn to my phone for quick and easy answers instead of asking for help or an explanation from my teacher because I was too embarrassed or felt uncomfortable stopping the whole class to have the teacher explain it to me. Because of this bad habit, I consistently did worse on tests and quizzes, lowering my overall grades in my classes. Students who are distracted in class and have falling grades as I did will usually turn to cheating. With just a click of a button, you can ask a friend for answers go to the bathroom to look up answers, or take pictures of a test to share with a friend. According to USA Today, McAfee, an online security software maker, found that in a newly released survey, one in three kids in the United States use cell phones or other devices to cheat. Plus, about six in 10 teens have seen or know another teen who used a connected device in class to cheat on an exam or quiz. I propose, Schools should enforce a ban on cell phone use in school by implementing a phone storage system in each classroom. This inexpensive solution would force students to place their electronic devices into their designated pocket immediately after they enter the classroom, preventing them from using it during class. Is it fair to all concerned? Yes. This crucial step to banning cell phones in school would be fair because students come to school to learn, not to be distracted by their cell phones. Taking away this simple distraction can significantly increase a student's grade, grades, improve their ability to retain information, and help them be successful in school. If there's an emergency, teachers can take the necessary steps to keep students safe and can contact or be contacted by the Office for Important News. Another benefit of banning cell phones in schools are fewer distractions to peers and students who are trying to study. 
If a student enters a class with a funny video or new game, it is likely to attract a crowd of students who are curious and will distract them from the, those students from their work. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Banning cell phone use in school will help students have goodwill and build better friendships because they will be able to connect on a more personal level with their classmates by sharing stories about their life instead of simple four-word conversations through a cell phone. According to a study conducted by Andrew Lepp, a PhD student from Kent University, students who tended to use their phone compulsively and at inappropriate times felt less socially connected to parents and peers than other students did. Most importantly, the removal of cell phones in school can help build better friendship with teachers. Many of the students who ignore and are rude to their teachers do it because they would rather be on their phone listening to music and be on social media. This behavior can cause tension between the teacher and the student. As the teacher starts acting stricter, it will cause the student to act out, creating an endless cycle. Without phones, students would not have anything to be distracted by and will pay attention, allowing the teacher and students to be on good terms. Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Yes, banning cell phones in schools is beneficial because it would allow students to focus solely on their education for the six hours and 45 minutes they're in school. Without the, distraction of student, without the distraction of cell phone, students will be able to capitalize on all the time given from teachers and study halls to studying and working on homework, giving them more free time at home to do things they enjoy. At first, students and parents would hate a policy that blocks cell phone use in school, but as, is, as it is enforced by all teachers, both parents and students will be able to see the positive effect it has on their schoolwork. Furthermore, this policy will help students understand that when they're in a learning environment, they should be focused on the task at hand, which can help teach students a good work ethic and help them succeed after high school. It is clear to me that this simple step can help students succeed in school by increasing a student's grades, ability to learn, and attitude towards school. I hope that my struggle with cell phone use in high school can help offer a solution for my school and other schools like it by helping them take the next step into banning cell phone use. Thank you. In addition, of course, to fundraising for charity, Rotary is a fellowship organization. This is important to remember, whereby members get together for shows, nights out, dinners, sporting events, and concerts. It truly becomes an extended family as members get to know each other's spouses and children and sometimes invite them to be guest speakers at our meetings. Rotarians are able to visit any club worldwide. Remember, Rotary is an international organization and meets some 1.2 million members representing all types of professions from all the corners of the globe. When a member visits a club, they can receive a banner, bring it back to their own club and display it. Our last contestant, contestant number eight. A world of technology, a digital era. Today, humans gravitate to their electronics like moths to a lamp. From the first moment after we wake up through the seconds right before we go to sleep, technology is deeply rooted in our lives, whether we like it or not. Whether we're watching videos, posting on social media platforms, texting friends and family, or completing work, technology has an utmost presence in society. On the face of it, technology appears to create a global network that brings people together. But in fact, as seen through research, society is suffering not only socially, but physically from technology overuse, which has been connected to obesity, mental health issues, social isolation, sleep deprivation, etc., etc., etc. My argument today is not that technology itself is detrimental to society, but that our overuse of technology is a damaging force and negatively alters social practices and behavior. Is it true? 
Well, it is true that social media bonds people closely, regardless of time and distance. So it is no surprise that over 72% of the American public has at least one type of social media. However, we as a people have fallen into the habit of living in our own digital world and staring at the device screen even when surrounded by people. But why? 50 years ago, if you responded to a letter in two weeks, that was the normality. In today's day and age, however, if you don't answer a text message within a couple of hours, people think you're not responsive and many times rude. Is this fair? Absolutely not. This stigma has led us to a newfound stress for being held to a much higher standard. As a result, we always have our devices on us, waiting for the inevitable text to reply to, news to catch up on, video to watch, or picture to like. And when we replace real life interaction with online communication, we are losing the ability to interact face to face and read social cues like uh, facial expression, tone of voice, and body language. But it helps to have some proof. The UCLA psychology department looked at two groups of 11 to 12 year olds. During the research, one group made significantly more progress than the other. The group deprived of all digital media, even television, performed significantly better at recognizing emotions than those allowed to keep texting, tweeting, and talking on Facebook after just five days. What does this have to say about society? Well, if only five days of technology deprivation can provide conclusive progress towards better face-to-face -face interaction, imagine the progress we as a society can make by cutting our technology use over the course of years. Cutting screen use allows more time for in-person relationships to grow and develop. This means that goodwill and friendships will flourish with a change in the way society functions. This is especially true since many times a person's online friends are merely acquaintances or friends of friends that fulfill the sole purpose of increasing their number of likes and followers. The next time you are on a social media platform, take a second to look through your friends or follower list. How many of those usernames do you actually communicate with or even consider as a friend? By devoting less energy to persons we do not even talk to, we can focus our attention on our real relationships and let them blossom into true friendships and partnerships in a world where there is no stress on how many retweets, favorites, or likes you receive on a selfie. Beyond the social effects, technology overuse has many physical effects on our lives as well. Perhaps the most dramatic impact is a drastic reduction in the amount of sleep. 50 years ago, the average adult got eight and a half hours of sleep. Now, we average less than seven hours a night based on the National Sleep Foundation, with many of my fellow peers getting even less than that. Screen time before bed reduces melatonin, our natural sleep-inducing hormone. The more electronic devices that a person uses in the evening, the harder it is to fall asleep and stay asleep. Besides increasing your alertness around bedtime, using devices also affects the quality of sleep you get. I even find myself, multiple days in a row, waking up exhausted and groggy even after getting a full eight hours of sleep. But why? I admit, I will use my phone before bed, and based on research from harvard.edu, screens are the culprit. Screens before bed delay the onset of and reduces the total amount of rapid eye movement sleep, or REM sleep, the deepest and most beneficial part of your sleep cycle. Devices also compromise alertness the next morning. So what does this mean? A chronic a decrease in sleep quality. Beyond our sleep, the increase in technology use is also contributing to the obesity epidemic in America. How? Well, screens themselves do not. Based on, the, based on data from obesityaction.org, junk food manufacturers have latched on to social networking sites, video games, and cell phone apps as ideal vehicles for their high calorie, high fat messages. And researchers have found these marketing approaches to be even more effective than kid-targeted TV commercials, which are extremely effective already. Therefore, more screen time equals more exposure to marketing of foods and drinks that promote weight gain. Overall, our increased use of technology is not only a detriment to our social development, but to our physical development as well. If we make a change, everyone involved will reap the benefits but we cannot put the blame on technology for the effects it has on us. We as a society are overusing technology, instigating these negative effects. 
by using our devices less. We can use more of our time to be active, build our in-person friendships, or both, and finish our day by having a good night's sleep, which will help tomorrow be a better day than the last. Thank you. Great having so many volunteers here, so many members from the public here. But our contest really would not be possible if it weren't for those that participated and were contestants. It takes an incredible amount of courage and also a lot of practice to be able to stand up here and practice skills that you'll use for the rest of your lives. That of speaking, presenting, reading, and writing. So let's hear it for our contestants, certainly. After tonight, the first place winner will give his or her speech at the 2020 district semifinals on Sunday, March 29 at 1 p.m. at the Henniker Community Center. Four judges will be present and the top four scorers from those semifinals will advance to the district finals, which are going to be held in Maine this year, the weekend of May 1 through 3, 2020. I want to especially thank some very distinguished people in our audience this evening. That is Jan Moynihan Cooney, certainly, for advising our contestants. The English department head at Merrimack High School. Also want to thank Mrs. Garland for her assistance. And in our audience tonight, this is Sharon Putney, who is the principal of Merrimack High School. Thank you for all you do. I want to certainly thank Merrimack TV for always uh, recording us and then playing us over and over again. It's amazing. Uh, those of you who spoke tonight, you'll be able to see yourself in February, March, April, May, all the way until next year, uh, so you can see how you did. So we want to thank them very much for taking the time tonight. Now remember, the Merrimack Club is on Facebook. We expect to have a like from each of you after tonight, that's for sure. And also remember to go to our website, themerrimackrotary.com. Now, we are going to take a brief recess. That is a brief intermission while we tally the scores and get the checks ready. So I ask that you not leave, but that you be patient and just bear with us briefly to get those accurate scores. So thank you once again. Okay, can I ask all eight of our student speech givers to come on up stage? you like? Whichever order you like. What a great bunch. As we went through this, I know that everybody had a program that they were able to read through, um, but we were hearing contestant one, two, and three, and not necessarily putting the faces and the names. So let's put the faces and names together. Um, Gabriella DeRocher. Who are you? Right here behind me. All right. Um, Sid DeHonoraj? Is that your name right? Yeah, DeHonoraj. DeHonoraj. Thank you for that, Sid. Um, Brene Dubis, and Andrea Gustafson, Aaron Murray, Alexa Quintero, Zach Stimmeling, Stimmeling, right right. and Zach Trudowski. All right, now we've got all the names and faces. Isn't that much better than get contestant one, two, and three? <laughs> all right, so let's begin with giving out the $25 award for positions four through eight. For our contestants. So the first is Zach Trudowski. Thank you. Thank you. You stuck with $25. Come forward. Let's get a picture paper. Somebody have a picture? There we go. Thank you. There you go. 
All right, Zach Stanley, come on over. Simon. Simon, thank Stanley. you. Simon, here you go. Thanks. 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 There you go. All right, Aaron Murray. Andrea Gustafson. Thank you. And Sid, give me that name again, Donaraj. Donaraj. Come on forward. Now we get to our top three winners, and the third place winner is Gabrielle Grosch. The check for $75. Thank you. Second place with a $150 check, Alexa Quintero. Renee Dubis, come on forward. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much.